Just a show of hands, did anybody see the presentation yesterday? By any chance, is everybody new? Yesterday? Okay. Um, before we get started, we did the same thing yesterday's presentation. It'd be helpful to know how many people in the audience have raised, let's say, half a million US dollars or euros or UK pounds in the past for production. Okay, so. So, just to give a quick overview and a highlight on our background before we jump in. Uh, we run two companies, as you'll see on the screen here, Bonded, which is a senior financing firm. We've done about 150 motion picture and TV movie transactions, and we'll talk about what the makeup of those deals have looked like. And then Buffalo 8, which is a production company. We produce about 35 to 40 feature films through that vehicle. Um, Joe runs the day-to-day -day of business on the Buffalo 8 side, both on the development as well as on the production side of our business. There's four partners who oversee that side of our company, and we'll dive into what it looks like when we put a film together, how we get those films financed, etc. And then Bondit is run by four partners out of LA and New York. Um, and we'll, we'll jump into how Bondit differs from how Buffalo 8 looks at film and how that applies to you guys. So we've given this presentation at Sundance, at Con, at Tribeca, at South by Southwest. The best way we found to sort of get through it is to go about 40 minutes through our slides and then open it up for about 10 minutes of Q&A. Uh, feel free, obviously, at the end to come say hello, ask for business cards, etc. Um, I'm actually out of business cards, so at the end of the presentation, we'll have a slide with our contact info. Feel free to take a photo of it, and Joe also has cards. Uh, but I'd say all questions, just hold them to the end, and we'll try and be uh, as in-depth, but as uh, simplistic as we possibly can. So as I mentioned, two companies. Uh, we founded Buffalo 8 in 2012. Based in Beverly Hills, we produced about 35 features. It's broken down into four divisions, like many production companies that you'll hear about. A development division, which is developing external creative, so projects that are brought to us. Uh, Joe can comment obviously more in depth, but producers, writers, directors bring us content on a pretty regular basis and we develop it either to produce in-house or to co-produce. Yeah, so we see projects really from all over the world, uh, mostly at the development script stage, uh, no money raised yet. And what we do is come on board you know, as consultants and uh, walk people through just how you know, you're going to go get that movie finance and you know Matt and I will obviously walk you guys through during the whole presentation as well. And then from those development projects, many of them, I'd say we probably have 50 to 75 per year that come through the doors that we end up working with. We'll, we'll look at a lot of the case studies later in today's presentation, how some of those have gone on to win things like Sundance, how they've gone on to be placed at South by Southwest, HBO. Uh, has purchased projects we've had in that division before. So truly taking an approach where our door is very much open in terms of letting content creators, whether that's short form, long form, first time directors or experienced, submit content. And that feeds us to the next department, which is the production side of our business. Joe oversees the day to day of that department, which is physically producing films, which you can obviously comment on better than I can. Yeah, so we're seeing films now uh, under a million dollars and up to about $5 million. Uh, and producing them, like Matt said, from the ground up, going on set, managing the budget, managing the schedule, uh, overseeing cast and crew, contracts, legal, really turnkey solution all the way from production, you know, through post-production, and finally to uh, delivery. And we'll oversee the sale of that film uh, domestically. So in North America, most producers will want to form those relationships themselves. And it makes a lot more sense to build English language if you're native English language with those distributors in North America. So you cut out the middlemen so you're not paying a 10, 20% fee on a sale that you could essentially make yourself. But internationally, like everyone else here in the Marche and everyone that's selling films, we partner with international sales companies depending on the specifics of the project to sell the film. 
Uh, and then we have a post-production division. So we handle animation, visual effects, color, editorial, both for our own projects as well as for third-party projects. Um, we have a post-production supervisor and a staff of contractors that oversee that side of our business. And then the last piece is a management company. Uh, about a year ago, we acquired a small management firm, about 30 actors and about 30 literary clients, so writer-directors. And what's been interesting is how much deal flow that has fed to other areas of our business. And we'll talk about the need as you guys go about not only raising capital, but putting your careers together, finding ways to either sort of look at it from a cross-sell perspective, meaning developing relationships that have the ability to grow into things much longer term. And I'll use, an, I'll use an example of something we're working on presently. When we acquired the management company, it wasn't seen to be a big financial gain. You know, no one looked at the deal as something that was going to make us instantaneously a ton more revenue. It was a long play in the sense that the access that clients and talent had to deals that otherwise we wouldn't have been involved with was huge. And so we're now involved in producing Spike Lee's new film because one of our clients put a project together with Spike and it got it off the ground and we got brought in now to produce it. And so seeing sort of the forest through the trees, the, 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 the reference makes a lot of sense, especially when we're putting these, these relationships together. And then there's Bonded, which we'll, we'll talk in depth about, but we found it in 2013, early 2014, backed by a hedge fund and by a few private individuals, and we'll talk in depth about the differences between those types of investors and what they're looking for. We're a senior security fund, so we'll talk a little bit about what that, that terminology means and how you should be thinking about it when you're raising your own financing. Uh, we've done, as I said, 115 feature films and television projects. Everything from studio films now all the way down to big TV fri franchise projects that you would recognize. And, and then we've had a big marquee year with projects at every major festival, Sundance, Tribeca, Berlin, and South by Southwest. So senior security. So Bonded was originally founded uh, with hedge fund backers. And what that means is they're institutional investors uh, at, a, at a high, high level who are, you'll hear this terminology quite a bit in finance, they're, they're yield investors. They're looking simply for yield. They're not investing for the fund or the ancillary value of the movie business, which lots of film investors are. These guys are truly looking for, let's say, eight to 10 to 12 to 15% return on their capital per year, and they look for different vehicles to offer them that kind of structure. Most of the film finance companies you'll see in CAN that are established, that have had a lengthy track record, they fit into two different buckets. Bucket one is institutional yield investors who are looking for a return on their investment, and B, or the second bucket, are high net worth folks or ultra high net worth folks who are willing to have fun, they don't need to be making money, definitely not in the short term, and they can take bigger risks, bigger losses for lengthier periods of time. We'll talk in depth as we get to the case study slide about raising money from those two groups of investors being drastically different. So when Bondit launched, we were backed solely by a hedge fund and by two high net worth private individuals. And the things that we were financing, as you'll see the DNA of the breakdown here, so union deposits, minimum guarantees, which are essentially pre-sales contracts, right? You'll hear lots of folks in here in the market and it can talk about pre-sales agreements. So whether that's at Netflix, someone like HBO, smaller international buyers who are coming in and purchasing content either prior to production, during production, or during post, and the producers want access to the capital that's locked in those contracts. And what that means is those contracts generally don't pay out until the project's been delivered and sometimes even lengthier. And so accessing that financing is a very age old mechanism of, of feature film production finance, but many banks have exited that space, especially given the size of a lot of these deals. And so you'll see the Netflixes of the world now offering a million dollars flat versus 10 years ago here at Pekin and at, at Berlin, you could piece that kind of film together with five, six, seven million dollars worth of pre-sales. And so banks are no longer in this space, which opens up opportunity for private funds like us, other private funds that you'll see here at the market to take advantage of. And also guys, you'll see in the case studies as well that you know on most films you're gonna mix up bucket one and bucket two with each other. So you're gonna be raising money from high net worth individuals and you're also gonna be raising money from lenders like both did. And then there's tax rebates. Now I know, I'm sure many in the audience here are from European countries or international countries. 
in the U.S. we don't have that has uh, as aggressive of grant and arts funds as you guys do internationally. And so the way that the U.S. has incentivized productions is by offering a cash back or a rebate mechanism or a refundable or transferable tax credit per state. Each of those states carry different jurisdictions in regards to what that looks like, what the transfer rate looks like, but it's essentially a way of saying every dollar you spend in our state, you get 10, 20, 30 cents back on the dollar. When people refer to soft money, that's generally what they refer to 100% in North America. Internationally, it can be a mix of tax rebates and grant funds. So film is an investment. So when we've given this presentation in the past, I've sort of tailored this slide to go off of what it seems like early stage producers, even producers who may be later in their careers, but as creative producers and now they're transitioning to starting to raise capital, what they look at versus how they should be thinking about where investors' mindsets are today. So film is an investment. There's a lot of competition for an investor's attention. The markets right now are, are very, very volatile internationally. Um, meaning the public markets in terms of the public stock markets, uh, private markets as well in terms of venture capital and areas that these investors used to be able to historically chase yields pretty consistently has, has changed significantly. And so understanding that there's a lot of competition for this attention is, is paramount. And understanding that there, there may often be times where you have literally one 60 second, 120 second pitch to an investor to either continue that discussion or for it to end entirely. And even as lengthy as our track record is today, I, I had an exchange this morning with an investor that I thought I had on the hook for a deal, so far so that I had, I had relayed to the agent who's packaging the deal that I think it's done, and then I get an email saying, I'm actually placing the capital elsewhere. And this is someone who we've worked with in the past, we've done 200 plus films now as, as a company, and you think, okay, this gets easier. It doesn't. Unless the money is truly yours in your own fund, it's always a hustle and it's always uh, hurting cats because you're always hurting, like Joe said, investors from different buckets. And unless someone's coming in and writing the full check, which has its own risks, it's, it's challenging. And so preparation, and we'll talk here about that, is huge. So the budget and the schedule. I spoke yesterday at length and there were a few questions asked about how do I go about knowing how much the film really should cost as I transition to a feature? How much, how much should I be trimming? Should I be shopping multiple different budgets to an investor? I think I'd say, almost as a rule of thumb, and Joe can comment more at length, but I think, as a rule of thumb, keep your budgets as low as you possibly can these days. Now, there's no reason for bloated, expensive budgets. We shot a, a great film that got into Sundance that Netflix made a, a tremendous offer on. Magnolia ended up buying it. Five years ago, that film probably would have been three and a half million dollar film. It was shot for 1.4 million. Yeah, and uh, next to that, and concurrently we were shooting uh, another film uh, in New York as well um, that was in Sundance and won a special jury for 700,000 uh, US dollars. So uh, you always want to be smart about your preparation, about budgeting, about scheduling. Um, you know, 18 to 24 days uh, always, and if you can shoot it for 500,000, do it. If you can shoot it for 350,000, do it. Uh, there's no reason to, you know, go up to investors as a first time or second time filmmaker with a budget at 10, 15 million dollars. It's, it's just too expensive these days. It's too big of a risk. Uh, and with the technology that we 